I want to welcome Dr. Ross Green to the show. I am so thrilled to have you here, and everybody else is very thrilled, so I have a whole list of questions for you. Great. Um, but I know there's some people out there who haven't heard of the CPS model, you know, those people who are hiding in dark corners somewhere. <laughs> so I wanted to start with that, but then I have a whole list of audience questions, and I just want to do kind of a Q&A for That's this great. episode. Um, to get into like some of the nitty gritty of CPS. Good. But first, we have to catch everybody else up. So if you can just okay. give an explanation of it. All right, so really quickly, uh, CPS stands for Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. And those three words are really important because this is not a model that is primarily focused on behavior. It is primarily focused on the problems that are causing behavior. And so it is a problem-solving model, not a behavior modification model. I find that, um, you know, in the CPS model, behavior is viewed simply as the signal or the fever, just the way the kid is communicating that they are stuck or having difficulty meeting certain expectations. And so unmet expectations in this model are known as unsolved problems, when we solve those problems with kids, um, the behaviors that are often the byproduct of those problems subside. And that's not only my anecdotal experience, that's what a lot of research is telling us as well. But the problem solving needs to be proactive um, because the very vast majority of unsolved problems that are causing challenging episodes are highly predictable. They happen every hour, every day, every week. It's just a matter of helping people sit down and figure out what those unmet expectations or unsolved problems are. And the problem solving is collaborative. This is something you're doing with the kid, not to him. Um, and that's a really big deal, too, because so often kids with behavioral challenges are accustomed to having us reward them or punish them or tell them what to do or tell them what they're doing wrong or tell them what they need to do better. But this is where we are actually engaging kids in the process of solving the problems that affect their lives. And it seems to work a whole lot better than simply telling a kid what to do. Yeah. And I think that's a, a great, that's the overview of the model. That's there's the 10,000 foot view. <laughs> I think that's perfect. And you know, your, your newest book, I think raising human beings really gives you very detailed information. Um, I was listening to the audio book, you know, by the pool for the last few weeks because I, you know, I'm old school. I mean, I know the explosive child from when I worked in treatment centers way back, you know, like 20 years ago, but raising a human being really, for those of you that haven't heard of this model, it just gives you so many good examples and it answers so many questions. So for those of you that don't know it, just listen or read that book and that I think that will really help flesh it out more. Great. I do think it's a counterintuitive approach for a lot of maybe old school parents, you know, where they're kind of, they feel like they're giving, they're losing control. So, um, but it's incredibly effective. And when you do it, it won't feel right. I think for some parents and for some parents, it will intuitively feel right. But for those that it won't feel right, you're going to get so amazing responses that you're going to, you're going to realize this is a really good approach. Well, and what I said in human, Raising Human Beings, of course, is that the, the control is an illusion anyhow. Yeah. Um, you're not shooting for control and, because you never had it in the first place. So you can't lose it if you don't have it. Um, but the harder you shoot for it, the less you actually have. Um, so what I talk about is that the most you can shoot for is influence. Mm -hmm. So I can't, I can't buy a parent control because that's an illusion. I can buy a parent influence, mm -hmm. and influence is really the best you got. Um, because you do have wisdom and experience and values, and you want to transmit those to your kid. But the harder you shoot for control, the less the kid is going to benefit from your experience, wisdom, and values. Yeah, totally agree. Okay, so I think that's a good nutshell. I want to get into, so I'm an anxiety and OCD specialist. And so yeah. that's all I talk about, especially OCD, which I think is a world that a lot of people don't understand. Yeah. And there were a lot of questions from my audience about kind of the OCD approaches with the CPS model, which I think mm -hmm. is kind of interesting on how you connect those two. Mm -hmm. So there's two main issues and then we'll get into their questions. These are kind yes. of the overall arching questions that I get a lot. Yep. Um, one is with ERP, exposure response prevention, 
incentive based models are, are very important. They, um, they help, you know, like, I think CPS can be used with ERP, but I think people don't understand that. And I'm going to do a whole episode next week on that. But, but when you have a kid and you engage them and you talk about what exposures they want to do, um, to address their intrusive thoughts, um, a lot of times to add that incentive, kind of that little carrot to help them say, hey, you're being brave and you can earn this is, is enough to get them kind of to go over the edge. Mm -hmm. And a lot of diehard CPS um, parents will, will not be okay with this because they think that's um, incentivizing treatment. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Well, number one, there are people who do exposure and response prevention in a way that is not collaborative at all. True. Yeah. That would be, that would be totally inconsistent with the model. Yeah. Um, th there are people for whom exposure and response prevention is something that while they are involving the kid in uh, helping coming up with a hierarchy, they are then uh, in a rather forceful way exposing and preventing the response. That, that is, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Right. So that's not consistent with the model at all. But I think that um, I'm not allergic to um, rewarding. I'm not big on rewarding and punishing in the kids that I work with because this is primarily a problem-solving model and rewarding and punishing doesn't solve the problems that cause the behaviors that we are rewarding and punishing for. So in the case of pure behavior, pure challenging behavior, I'm not a big fan of rewarding and punishing because quite frankly, I think it misses the boat. It has us distracted. It has us focused on the wrong thing. But if a therapist said to me, I'm seeing that with exposure and response prevention, reward to help a kid participate in the process is helpful, Far be it for me to tell them not to do a reward. Yeah. I'm just careful about it because, and you know, I don't tend to treat a lot of OCD. For me, OCD is number one, without question, one of the hardest things to treat. I, I find that it is one of the most difficult disorders there is. It is tough. Um, it, it can be extremely debilitating. Um, if somebody says to me a reward will help a kid participate, and if I feel that a reward is really necessary to help the kid participate, and if I don't think that the kid is doing what the kid is doing solely on the basis of a reward, I'd be gung-ho. Okay. And I think it's a good clarification because I am really big on, on taking your approach and taking ERP and merging them. Um, I don't think there's enough collaboration with uh, mental health professionals who are treating OCD or parents who are approaching kids with OCD. And I do think the incentive, uh, the incentive is very helpful because you are talking to a kid about going into a shark tank mentally and you really want to encourage that. But I think the education component to the kid, why are we doing this? We're not doing it to you. We're going to do it together. And I'll talk all about that next episode, but I just wanted to make sure that I heard your angle on that. One more thing on OCD and then we'll get into questions. Unless no, you have to the only thing I would add is um, I um, often hear that a reward is helping. I'd want to be really sure that the reward was really necessary. And I'd want to be really sure, and I'm repeating myself from what I just said a few minutes ago, I'd want to be really sure that as in the case of the reward and punishment literature in the kids that I work with, not OCD, the kids that I work with, the literature in the kids that I work with is that reward, that the effects of a reward and punishment program dissipate once the program is removed. Because all we're focused on is behavior. Now in OCD, you are just incentivizing the kid with a reward to participate in exposure and response prevention. I would want to make absolutely certain that I didn't see regression to the mean if I added a reward and the only thing the kid was benefiting from was the reward, 
then I would put it in the exact same boat as what the research tells us in the kids that I work with. But if a therapist like you said, no, the reward is just to get the kid to participate, but it's the exposure and response prevention that is giving me durable results over time, and I don't need to continue the reward over time because the, re the re exposure and response prevention did its thing, then I'd be good with rewarding a kid to participate in exposure and response prevention. It's hard enough as it is. If an incentive gets the kid there, great so long as it's exposure and response prevention that's doing the trick, not the reward. Otherwise, the effects of treatment, I would predict, would dissipate because eventually we're going to run out of rewards. Yeah, and I agree. And I think there is, you just want them to get off that cliff and then, you know, and then we're tackling the OCD and the rewards are pulled back uh, yeah. and then you're going up the hierarchy with them. Good. Great. Same thing with anxiety. You know, it's, um, you're pulling them back as you go. So. I think that answered it. One more question about OCD in general, and then we'll move on to the just general questions. Um, and this kind of goes to plan C and OCD again. Sorry that we talk about OCD because <laughs> that's oh, kind of my world. Do, right? Yeah, but a lot of times with the OCD loop, you know, a kid will have a compulsion and the compulsion will actually involve the parent. So the parent's kind of the sink. So if I have like moral OCD, I have an intrusive thought and then I have to tell my parent in a certain way something and they have to respond in a certain way and then we're done. Or they have to clean the toilet in a certain way and then we're done. Like they, the parent is the sink. And so yep. a lot of times with the OCD treatment that I do, I tell parents to slowly pull back their accommodation. Now sometimes the child, and, and, and I talk a lot about collaboration with the child, you know, let's talk about what things I can pull back. Uh, and I'll go into that in the next episode. But I wonder, some parents were saying to me, how do you do that with plan C and how do you collaborate when maybe your kid will always want you to do compulsions? I don't know if that makes sense. Well, I guess my only confusion is what plan we're really talking about. Um, and I wish I knew how to ha turn off my ringer. I've tried before and I okay. can't figure it out on this phone. It's okay. um, it doesn't actually usually ring that much, but it's ringing now. Um, <laughs> I think you might be talking about plan B because plan C is where you are setting aside a particular expectation, at least for now. And so if I'm plan seeing a compulsion, I'm saying we're not working on it right now. It is what it is. If we're plan being a compulsion, then we are problem solving with the kid, with the kid putting his or her concern on the table, which is um, their feeling of the need to do this and what's going to happen if they don't. But then the adult is entering his or her concern into consideration and saying, well, here's why doing it the way you want me to do it doesn't work for me. Here's, I can't always do it when you want me to. Um, sometimes I'm in the middle of something. And so in plan B, we'd be coming up with a plan, a solution for what it would look like instead. Plan C, we're not even working on it. Right. Plan B, we're working on it so that it's being refined in a way that works for both parties. So I guess what I'm hearing in your question, at least, is that you're asking more about plan B than plan C, because with plan C, you wouldn't really be doing anything. With plan B, you'd be trying to refine the compulsion. Yeah, and I, for the for the and it was a it was an audience question, and I think, I think her she did say Plan C, and I think her Plan C was um, that that people are interpreting that they're not supposed to touch this stuff at all. You know, it's too hard. My my child's gonna have a meltdown, so I'm gonna just Plan C it all. And I think, I think your answer is good. It makes sense because you you would Plan B it, and we'll talk about that next episode about yeah. how to do it. So, all right, let me have some random questions for you. Great. So, and they're a little bit different, but I kind of clumped them together. So Lynn asked, how do you get the school on board? And I know you wrote, I think an entire book on this. Um, if the school just wants to plan a everything and they don't want to read your books. Uh, <laughs> you find somebody in the building who you think will be receptive 
Because when we refer to the school, we're referring to a lot of different people. Some people mean the principal, some people mean the kid's teacher. So the school could refer to many people. But what I find with, us with, with some decent reliability, not perfect reliability, is that there's always somebody in the school who the parent can go to to ask for guidance on how to navigate the school and how to um, get some people in the school more on board than they are. Yeah. We just have to recognize that um, many schools, by no means all, but many, are plan A. That's sort of traditional school discipline, just like it's been traditional parenting. Um, the adult decides what the solution is and imposes it on the kid. That's what plan A is. That's the way a lot of school discipline programs still work. Um, so it's not really sort of that unusual for a school to be all plan A. The big question is if we look at, I mean, the, the, the persuasion that I use is let's look at your discipline data. In every school, it's the same 10, 20, 30 kids, depending on the size of the school, that are accounting for 80 to 90 percent of the discipline referrals, 80 to 90 percent of the detentions, suspensions, in some states still paddlings. Um, that's proof that it's not working. Um, in the case of an individual, so they should be taking a look at their discipline program because their discipline program isn't working. It's actually costing them a lot of money because the kids who don't respond to the discipline program end up having to be placed in very costly alternative programs. So it's in, it's in everybody's best interest. These kids are still disrupting the classroom process. It's in everybody's best interest, not just the behaviorally challenging student, for us to change the way we're doing things. But in the case of an individual kid, you do have special education law working in your favor. Um, if push comes to shove, then I'm going to want collaboration. Most people won't put the name of a particular model in an IEP. But we can get all kinds of stuff into the IEP that's about identifying unsolved problems, identifying lagging skills, and working with the student to solve those problems as a means of reducing challenging behavior. But the usual first step for most parents is to find somebody in the building who they think will be receptive to the model and who can give them sort of the lay of the land on how to make this happen for their kid. Yeah, I like that. Find a back door because there's always somebody. There's always somebody 99% of the time. Yeah. Okay. Moving on because I want to make sure I can hopefully get to a lot of these. Yep. Um, this I'll one is not to be so long-winded. <laughs> no, these are good answers. So, you know, it's okay. We can cut it out. Um, this is a really good question because I feel like this I see across the board. People misinterpret your model as a no discipline model. They, mm -hmm. they look at it as um, no structure and, and don't, don't put any boundaries in place. So Laura asked, um, she was actually, it was kind of less of a question and more of a comment. She was saying the CPS model is actually more open to structure and tight discipline than many people think. There's a lot of emphasis put on plan C, which many people interpret as anything goes. The difference in his model is how the discipline is applied, or at least that's been my understanding. She was replying to somebody else, which I thought was, a, I took it because I thought it was good. What do you think about that? Yep. Well, number one, I'm accustomed to having the model be misperceived. Although I've done a lot over the last 20 years since the explosive child came out to um, help there be fewer misperceptions. Uh, I think you are more of an authority figure when you're implementing this model than you are when you are placing expectations on your kid that you already know he can't meet and suffering through countless challenging episodes as a result of it. I, I wouldn't call that an authority figure. Um, but I guess it depends on your definition of an authority figure. If um, authority figures are all about consequences and all about being punitive, then first of all, count me out. I don't even want to be that kind of authority figure. But if you're talking about really understanding what's getting in your kid's way and taking proven steps to making things better, then you're being an authority figure. And here's a fascinating piece of data from my 2004 study on the CPS model as compared to rewarding and punishing of all things. The parents in that study who felt better about their ability to set limits 
where the parents who had learned how to do collaborative and proactive solutions, not the parents who had learned how to do rewarding and punishing. So there's a fascinating finding for you. Um, this is a very structured model. This is a very hard model to implement. You are very much of an authority figure when you are implementing this model. It's just that you are solving problems in this model collaboratively rather than unilaterally. Um, if unilateral is somebody's definition of authority, then they're going to be having a lot of challenging behavior in their kid. Yeah. That is a good explanation. Um, let me see. So I'm going to keep reading them. So Fred, I don't think that's her real name. <laughs> By the way, I, I should mention, this is me being slightly long-winded. That's okay. This, this is the dilemma in society. A lot of people have very interesting definitions of what it means to be strong, what it means to be muscular. Um, this model requires a lot of strength, understanding what's really getting in your kid's way, taking steps that make things better, a lot of strength, a lot of authority required. Yeah. But this model is no different than what goes on in society in terms of people's um, interesting definitions about what it means to be strong. You're not being strong necessarily by starting a war. Sometimes you're being strong by settling the issues so that there's no war in the first place. Yeah. All right. So that brings me to a question of my own. <laughs> so, so, cause I feel like I do the CPS model personally, I have three kids, but there are moments where it's not a, it's not a planned situation. Yep. I'll give you an example. Um, Cause then I wind up having like CPS guilt <laughs> because I'm like, <laughs> that was totally non CPS like. <laughs> yes. So I took three of my kids, six, eight and 14 to a restaurant. And for some reason they were out of control. They're normally really well behaved. So we didn't proactively collaborate on how to behave at a restaurant because they're normally really good. For some reason, all three of them decided to be really difficult at one go. And so I do count, which I know you're like counting. And so they were acting up and we were going to do something afterwards. And it was like, if I, you know, three strikes, you're out. If we get to three strikes, we're not doing the next thing. And initially I did try to, to take a softer approach. Like, Hey, we're trying to enjoy this meal. Can we all just relax? You know, they didn't, they were, they were feeding off of each other, but then I'm like one and they're all quiet and we have yeah. a great meal. But then I leave there thinking, well, that was not very collaborative. <laughs> so I have moments like that where I feel like it's super effective, but then I feel guilty. But for the big issues, I'm very proactive. I'll sit there. We'll talk about it. We'll make a plan. We'll do all of that stuff. So I'm sure other parents feel that way too. Yes. Not sure people should feel CPS guilt, although I think <laughs> it's a very funny concept. Um, you, you know, in the parents of behaviorally challenging kids, holding up one finger can make things worse. That's the key. If in your kids holding up one finger ends it at that moment, I wouldn't have a problem with that. So long as um, it's being discussed later, right? Guys, help me understand what was going on there because I don't want that to happen again. So do we have a problem that we need to solve? Because I don't understand what just happened, right? You could also do that in the heat of the moment, right? Uh, your odds on almost everything are less good in the heat of the moment, right? And it sounds like you tried to say, let's have a nice meal here. My wording might have been a little bit different. Um, my wording might have been, dudes, <laughs> what is going on here, right? Because you guys don't usually act this way in a restaurant. You're acting this way now. Somebody tell me what's going on so we can solve it. Um, and that's what I, those are the words I probably would have used. And yes, that would be me in collaboration mode. So, you know, you holding up one finger then, I'm not sure you should have suffered a great case of CPS guilt. <laughs> but I do think it's something that needs to be talked about later. But if it can be talked about later, it could also potentially be talked about now. Guys, what is going on here? This is not like you guys. Tell me what's going on. We're being silly. We're, ju we're just in a silly mood, right? 
well, I'm not, I can't eat this way. So let's think about what we can do about you being in a silly mood. And so I'm still in collaboration mode, right? I'm being a little bit more forceful about it. But it's different than simply holding up one finger. If it, if it ends with one finger, I would say the problem is still not solved because holding up one finger solves nothing. So at the very least, I'd want to talk about it later. The big question, of course, is could you have been even more collaborative then? But I'm not sure you should feel great CPS guilt for having not been collaborative right then. <laughs> okay. Well, and I think, I think a lot of people do have CPS guilt because I, I think it's hard to collaborate. It's, it's sometimes it's counterintuitive in the moment, for sure. And, and there's well, some I think it's not instinctive in the moment. Yeah. Um, but I think it can become instinctive in the moment. Yes, I agree. It, it's a work in progress. Um, this question is related to what we're talking about. So Jamie and Anna both asked, what do you do with a child who refuses to collaborate? Any attempts to do CPS are ignored or trigger an explosion in and of themselves? Got it. Lots of things to f f check in about on that. Um, number one, I want to make sure that they are not trying to talk with the kid about his challenging behavior but instead about the problems that are being caused by those behaviors. Number two, I'd want to make sure that they are really doing plan B proactively, not emergently. Number three, I'd want to make sure that they've worded their unsolved problems well. So those are the three things I'd want to make sure of before I actually started diving deeper with the kid. But if those things are all squared away, and by the way, often those things are not squared away. So those things often take care of the kid not participating, but if we still have a non-participant, we need to find out why. Um, and um, I want to do that proactively. And there are many kids, for example, who feel like even though we're doing plan B, he's still in trouble. So the, the, the I'm in trouble part hasn't changed for that kid in the shift from A to B, right? Worst case scenario, if I can't get the kid to talk to me about difficulty, in other words, difficulty participating in the solving pro problem solving process becomes the first unsolved problem, mm -hmm. right? And the introduction to the empathy step would sound like I've noticed you're having difficulty participating in my efforts to talk to you about problems. What's up? So that's, it sounds like any other unsolved problems, except now that's our top problem, right? If the kid still won't respond, I'm probably holding up fingers and asking the kid to respond to my statements or theories. Um, you still think you're in trouble. So five, I teach many people this, five means very true, four means pretty true, three means sort of true, two means not very true, one means not true at all. And now to relieve the kid of the burden of talking, all he's got to do is hold up fingers. You still feel like you're in trouble. All right, now, now we've gotten information, but he's participating, he's just not talking, right? You still think I'm mad at you. You don't know what to say when I ask you questions. That's a good one to know. You think if you're honest, you're gonna, be, you're gonna make me mad. Good to know. These are all good things to know. There are many reasons that a kid might choose not to participate, history being number one on the list. If we need alternative ways to find out what's making it hard for the kid to participate, after we've made that our number one unsolved problem, we can go with fingers, we can go with a survey, we can text the kid. Lots of ways to communicate with kids besides having them sit right in front of you. Yeah, I like that. I like the hands too, you know, for nonverbal kids. I think that's, that's really helpful. And that the first thing you solve is the problem. Okay. Um, yeah, Anna also commented, this is more of a comment, but I thought it was an important one. She said, I'm afraid of the house descending into chaos if I plan C everything. You're not plan seeing everything. But to make her feel better, well, two things to make her feel better. Number one, you're not plan seeing everything. Number two, if you've got a lot of unsolved problems, then those expectations aren't getting met anyways. If they're not getting met anyways, then either you have chaos already or you're going to have less chaos by eliminating all of the meltdowns that were occurring over expectations the kid wasn't meeting anyways. So 
it's interesting. Number one, you're not plan seeing everything, but number two, believe it or not, plan C, which is the, the key word for plan C is prioritizing. Prioritizing does not lend itself to chaos. I find that families that are doing a nice mix of B and C definitely do not feel like they have descended into chaos because not everything is plan C and all of those meltdowns that were occurring on expectations the kids not meeting anyways, now that we've removed those expectations, we don't have chaos, we have a lot fewer meltdowns and we are slowly but surely chipping away at the unsolved problems we've prioritized. Yeah, and I think that's a good explanation to differentiate what people think is just maybe letting things go. This is not a just let things go model. Right, and I think people misinterpret that, so it's, these they are good do. clarifications. Um, well, unfortunately, those are people, there are people who only read about the plan C part of the model. Yeah. If all you're reading about is don't do A and only do C, then you are sort of, even though plan C is prioritizing, not giving in, you are now stuck in the same rut that you were, which is either impose your will and have a massive episode or give in. That's not what this model is about. First of all, plan C is not giving in. It's about prioritizing. And secondly, don't forget the other option. The hallmark of this model, while plan C is important, the hallmark of this model is plan B. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people, you know, they just, they give advice, but maybe they haven't read anything and really understood the model. So um, Jen and Colleen both asked similar questions. How do you get plan A relatives, partner spouses on board with a CPS plan? You either turn them on to the Lives in the Balance website where everything's free or you give them a copy of the explosive child and tell them to read it. But most of all, you can't escape having people understand why challenging kids are challenging. It's inescapable. And the research tells us that, and 40 to 50 years of research too, tells us that challenging kids are challenging because they're lacking the skills to not be challenging. If they're lacking skills, and if those lagging skills are making it hard for them to meet certain expectations, that's the knowledge everybody needs to have, and not just relatives. Anybody who works with kids needs to know that when kids are exhibiting challenging behavior, whether it's at the mild end, crying, whining, pouting, sulking, or at the more extreme end, hitting, spitting, kicking, throwing, destroying, this is a kid who's lacking skills and who's having difficulty meeting certain expectations. And rewarding and punishing isn't gonna make a dent in those lagging skills and unsolved problems. That's what relatives need to understand. That's what everybody needs to understand. Plan B doesn't tend to make a lot of sense to people unless they understand how this kid got to be this way in the first place. The good news is there's just a ton of free resources on the Light of Lives in the Balance website and the books are relatively cheap. Yeah, and, and I think whenever I have a family where I think maybe the parent won't read stuff, um, you have an audiobook for the explosive child, which I think is only an hour and a half. It's a great like condensed summary, very easy. And so I can normally convince a parent to at least listen to that. So yep. they won't go to the website, get the audiobook. That will help. Um, so Leslie asked a great question and I want to know the answer to this too. Is there a way to teach siblings to do plan B with each other? Yeah. Um, we do plan B with siblings all the time. The adult's going to have to facilitate the process. Um, so they're going to need a facilitator first because nobody, they, neither of them knows how to do it yet. And so we are picking unsolved problems that apply to the siblings and having an adult facilitate plan B. I don't know. You do that four or five times. I think they know how to do it. Yeah, I think so too. And I think that'd be a great thing to just let them go in and do that themselves. Um, wouldn't it have been nice if in the restaurant the other night... <laughs> you and your significant other, if he or she was with you, had said, boys, had been able to say, boys, I can't sit here and eat dinner with you like this. Um, you clearly have a problem that you need to solve with each other. We're going outside for five minutes. When we come back, I want to know what your solution is to the difficulty you're having in the restaurant right now. So I'll be back. You guys take care of it. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Now they don't need a facilitator anymore when you get to that point. Yeah, that would be beautiful. 
Okay, one final question. This is a very specific question. Um, Tara asked, she's gotten comments that when a child is receiving ABA services, that CPS is so different that it can't also be done. <laughs> well, depends on how the person doing the ABA was trained. Their ABA people are not all the same. ABA people within the field of ABA, ABA people often don't even agree with each other. Um, many people trained in ABA think that collaborative and proactive solutions fits beautifully within ABA, especially in its emphasis on skills. Um, whether they are being as collaborative as I might like, I'm not sure. Whether they are focused on solving problems or not, I'm not always sure, but there are many, many ABA people who are very receptive to CPS, and then there are ABA people who break out in hives when they hear about CPS. Totally depends on the ABA person. I actually come across more of the former than the latter. Most of the ABA people I work with are very open to and receptive to CPS, like I just said, sometimes I need some help on the collaboration end. Sometimes I need help on focusing on solving problems rather than focusing on behavior and incentivizing good behavior. Um, but bottom line is ABA and CPS are not incompatible with each other, but it totally depends on how the ABA person was trained. That's a good answer. I think that makes sense. There well, you I go. got to the bottom of my list. I am outstanding. So Yes, I mean, we did that. I really appreciate you coming on because that, those were some really good clarifications that I think people Great. struggle with. So thank you for your time. How can people find you? You're everywhere, but where's the best place to go? Livesinthebalance.org. Okay. And I know a lot of people talk about your private Facebook group too. So that's very big, nice, supportive community to support. It is. Yes. People love that. All right. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.